Greetings from the Petersburg Church of Christ. We thank you for allowing us into your home today, and we encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with the message that's presented today. We would also encourage you to take notes and send us any questions or comments that you have concerning today's message to the address that will be provided at the end of the lesson. We invite you to join us any opportunity that you have. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are located at 205 Russell Street, just off the south side of the Petersburg Square. Have your Bible handy, please turn to 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. It's interesting the way the Bible is written. I didn't write it. I've been studying it a long time. A lot of things I don't understand. But here in 1 John 2, 8 through 18, and chapter 4, 1 through 4, there's a theme set up. Notice what it is. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last day. It's the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. I've noticed this through the years that in this text of Scripture, it varies from talking to little children, to fathers, to little children, to fathers, to young men and fathers. And I'm not sure exactly what this is trying to say other than the fact that God is giving admonitions to those who are in the family of God. Little children is an expression in 1 John that refers to people who are already Christians. But the fact that the Bible says this and makes us stop and think about the relationship between fathers and children, parents and children, is something that God uses in the Bible. I have a lot of books in my library. One of my favorite books is the lesson outlines for a great gospel meeting it was held in Texas years ago. Brother Batchel Baxter was the preacher, had excellent lessons, and in that book was a chapter on God's way for the home. 
God's way for the home it's rich and in that he used an illustration that I'd like to share with you years ago before the United Nations building was built in New York City they were trying to determine where to put this great needed building they decided that it ought to be in the United States so they began looking for property and they couldn't find any and finally John D. Rockefeller in some of his associates and people he knew came up with the idea of tearing down a slum area in New York City on the East River I believe it was and from that slum area they would use the property to build the United Nations building upon and in all the work and organization and trying to get it done one of the greatest contracts that was drawn up for the United Nations building was in a restaurant one evening the contract was drawn up on the back side of the menu for the restaurant where they were eating millions of dollars worth of property was involved and some have said that was probably one of the greatest contracts that had ever been developed I beg their pardon the greatest contract that was ever drawn up on the face of this earth was when God took one man and one woman and united them in the contract the Bible calls the home, the family. One man, one woman who love God, who love each other is the most needed contract that has ever existed on the face of the earth. The contract for the family predates even the church you read about in the Bible. I don't know how you consider your contract with your husband or your wife and your family. But I would hope that you would stop and realize that that contract is something that God had something to do with. And we wonder what's going on in our nation today when the contract for the family is under fire, has been forgotten, thrown away. Children do not even know who their own mother and father is throughout our society today. If we listen to the Bible and we take the Bible as our guide, we can see our way through the smoke and the trouble and the distress that's in our country today. For a little while, we want to talk about problem children or problem parents. And to get us into it, I don't know who it was that wrote this. No person's name attached to it. If you know anything about the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, this person who wrote this on Jonah and the whale hit the nail square on the head. Now listen, my children. I'll tell you a tale. How old Jonah, the prophet, got caught by the whale. The whale caught poor Jonah and bless your dear soul. He not only caught him, but swallowed him whole. A part of this story is awfully sad. It's how a big city went to the bad. When the Lord saw those people with such wicked ways, he said, 
I can't stand them more than 40 more days. He spoke to old Jonah and said, Go and cry to those hard-hearted people and tell them that I give them 40 days more to get humbled down, and if they don't do it, I'll tear up their town. Jonah heard the Lord speaking and he said, No, that's against my religion and I won't go. Those Nineveh people ain't nothing to me and I am against foreign missions, you see. He went down to Joppa and there in great haste, he boarded a ship for a different place. The Lord looked down on that ship and said he, Old Jonah is fixing to run off from me. He set the winds blowing with squeaks and with squeals, and the sea got rowdy and kicked up its heels. Old Jonah confessed it was all for his sin. The crew threw him out, and the whale took him in. The whale said, Old fellow, don't you forget, I am sent here to take you out of the wet. You will get punished to right for your sin. So he opened his mouth and poor Jonah went in. On beds of green seaweed that fish tried to rest. He said, I will sleep while my food I digest. But he got mighty restless and sorely afraid. And he rumbled inside as the old prophet prayed. The third day that fish rose up from his bed. With his stomach tore up and a pain in his head, he said, I must get to the air mighty quick, for this filthy backslider is making me sick. He winked his big eyes and wiggled his tail and pulled for the shore to deliver his mail. He stopped near the shore and looked all around and vomited old Jonah right up on the ground. Old Jonah thanked God for his mercy and grace and turning around to the whale made a face. He said, after three days I guess you have found a good man, old fella, is hard to keep down. He stretched himself out with a yawn and a sigh and sat down in the sun for his clothing to dry. He thought how much better his preaching would be since from whale seminary he had a degree. When he had tested and dried in the sun, he started for, when he had rested and dried in the sun, he started for Nineveh, most on the run. He thanked his dear Father in heaven above for his tender mercy and wonderful love. And though he was nearly three days late, he preached from the time he entered the gate till the whole population repented and cried and the great hand of justice and vengeance was stayed. Children, when you disobey, remember this rule. When you run from God's call, look out for the whale. There are animals to catch you on sea or on land, and children are swallowed much easier than man. There's a lot of practicality in that little did approach. I find that we're living in time when anything that refers to the Bible is sneered at and made fun of. Well, you can't make fun of what we're about to talk about. If you don't believe the idea of problem children or problem parents is discussed in the scriptures. You haven't read passages like this one. In the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning at verse 1, listen to the problem that Adam and Eve had with their boys. What happened? And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain 
brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance false? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? What had happened? What had gone wrong? As far as we know, these were the first two boys that ever walked the face of the earth under the mandate of Adam and Eve. God asked these two young men to offer sacrifices. One paid attention to what God said, the other one did as he pleased. When Cain saw that Abel's offering was accepted and his was rejected, it tore him up on the inside. He didn't like it. If you notice closely in the way that verse is worded, upon Cain's countenance falling in verse 5, and God asked him a question. He says, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If he had done what he was supposed to do, uh, that wouldn't have happened. But he makes it clear that sin was lying at the door and Cain entered in and the envy and the jealousy that came into Cain's heart over Abel being accepted and him being rejected prompted the first murder the killing of a human being on the face of the earth was Cain honest about it he tried to deny it he says am I my brother's keeper the Lord got very specific. He said, the blood of your brother cries unto me from the ground. God knew what had happened. Problem boys. One killed the other. We live in a world today where that sort of thing happens. We'll draw our conclusions a little bit later, but let's go on. In the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis, verses 19 through 26, we find another Old Testament father who had a problem with his boys. Genesis chapter 9, beginning at verse 19. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. Jim and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered their, the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. What's going on here? They had a problem with Ham. Ham saw his father's nakedness and he went off and he talked to his brothers about it. I don't know what all that suggests. No doubt, probably some other thing. 
But the problem developed, were they in the problem by themselves? Was Ham a problem simply because of his own doing? Think about that one, Mr. Mitch. Go over to the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis. And there we find Lot having a problem with his two daughters. They had fled toward Sodom. The Bible says that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. And here we find two young ladies, two young daughters getting their father drunk and incest involved with their own father. Problem. You can't help but see that there's a problem here. You know one of the things that convinces me the Bible is right, it reveals the truth about everybody and everything. Don't deal with this book if you don't want to get showed up for what you are. I was commenting to somebody the other day out in the community somewhere around about here that the only way you can see your soul is if you see it through the looking glass of the Word of God. You can't take your soul out and look at it. But you can look at it through a knowledge of the truth. Lot had a problem with his two girls. They got him drunk. He allowed it to happen. And the sin came. You remember the story of Jacob and Esau and Rebekah and the offering of the savory meat in the 28th chapter of the book of Genesis. The Bible makes it clear that there was a problem with Jacob and Esau. Was it their own doings? You go on through the Old Testament and you find insta, 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 in situations after situations where the uh, people were showed up for what they were. Jacob had ten problems with his boys. And what was it they did? They sold Joseph to a band of Midianites to get rid of their troublemaker, their dreamer. That problem. Was it their own doings? You go on into other characters in the Old Testament. David had a problem with Absalom. There was a TV special on not too long ago of David and Bathsheba and David and Absalom and it was pretty well true to what the book had to say about the subject. Well, was Absalom in and of and by himself the problem? No, if you'll examine these situations, you'll come to find out who was it that caused the problem to come about with Cain and Abel. Who was it that had sowed the sin into the human family? Eve started it. Adam jumped on the bandwagon. Sin had entered into the family. And Cain rose up and slew his brother. You know, if you're honest, you're sincere about your study of the Bible. You have to realize that the problem was not just the younger generation. The younger generation had seen the violation of God's will with their own people. And they had learned from the former generation how to do what they were doing. There are a lot of lessons that need to be learned. I wonder if we in the human family today, this side of the cross, it's stop to realize that some of the problems that we're having today with young people and their attitudes toward things 
is nothing more than what moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas had sowed in their hearts and they're reaping what we sow. I'm afraid it's the truth. I'm afraid we need to be honest about this and realize that you cannot, as one lady said, point your finger at somebody else and three of them not be pointing right straight back at you. And this is found in the scriptures. Problem children were caused by problem parents. Somebody made the observation and says, well, I can't understand why my son or my daughter curses. I don't. And if that person would have only been honest and listened to the bywords and the euphemisms and the suggestive phrases that had come forth from a mother or father's voice is exactly what caused their child to do what he did. Or somebody said, well, I can't understand why my son got drunk. When that father had a six-pack of Ertl 92 stick back in the refrigerator. Young couple was killed in a car wreck, drinking and driving. The father was irate. He was upset. He was going to take to the law and do everything he could against the people that had, that had caused him to be killed in that car wreck. And little did that father know that he had planted the seed in his own children's heart in the wet bar that he had back in the house where they had learned to drink. I don't understand why my son gambles who throws his money away. Did you ever go to pay for your gas at Walmart and have to stand in line for those buying the lottery tickets to have priority in the sale? That bothers me. We have become a nation that is gambling to the hills. And we wonder why our children do what they do. Here a son is caught for thievery. He has stolen something. And the father finds out about it and he said, well, I can't understand why my son would rob or, or, or take something not his. When that very boy saw his dad pull a slick deal, catch more than his limited fish, kill a doe deer out of season. And we wonder why they are what they are. Where did they get it from? Well, somebody says, well, I can't understand why my son won't obey the gospel. And when that very boy has seen his father miss the services of the church repeatedly without any real reason, that his father by his example had showed him that it really church really wasn't that important, that his soul salvation was really not the most important thing that he had to deal with. And his father had tainted the very stream that he couldn't understand why his son could never become Christian. Let me stop with a piece that General Douglas MacArthur is credited of having said, let me see if I can find it here, I've got it someplace in this book. It's quite interesting that one of the most credited uh, generals in the wars of this nation uh, they missed it somewhere let me see if I can find it it's worthy of consideration because of the uh, great importance of what he says General Douglas MacArthur a father's prayer are you ready for this one? 
I'm not going to add a word, take a word out. Build me a son, O Lord, who will be strong enough to know when he is weak and brave enough to face himself when he is afraid. One who will be proud and unbending in honest defeat, but humble and gentle in victory. Build me a son whose wishes will not replace his actions. A son who will know thee, and that to know himself is the foundation stone of knowledge. Send him, I pray, not in the path of ease and comfort, but in the stress and spur of difficulties and challenge. Here let him learn to stand up in the storm. Here let him learn compassion for those who fail. Build me a son whose heart will be clear, whose goal will be high. A son who will master himself before he seeks to master others. One who will learn to laugh, yet never forget how to weep. One who will reach into the future yet never forget the past. And after all of these things are his, this I pray, enough sense of humor that he may always be serious, yet never take himself too seriously. Give him humility so that he may always remember the simplicity of true greatness, the open mind of true wisdom, the meekness of true strength. Then I, his father, will dare to whisper, I have not lived in vain. If you've still got your father living or your mother living, I hope you will pay them some attention. Most of us do not have that privilege to tell our mother or our father how we appreciate what they did. When I was coming up through the teenage years, I thought my dad was the nearest know-nothing of anybody that ever walked the face of the earth. But when I got through, and I got became a man, and I got married, and I started preaching, all of a sudden, every year that went by, my dad became one of the smartest men I had ever known. And God gave me the opportunity to go to him personally and look him in the face and squarely tell him how much I appreciated what he had done for us. He had sent seven children through four years of Christian colleges and that ain't chicken feet. We are what we are today because of our parents. Oh, how we need to recognize the good and the bad of that. But when we become grown people, we have to stand on our own two feet. We have to take it on the job. We have to take it like it is. Some things we don't like. Some things we love. But we're going to have to come to grips with the reality of what the Bible teaches concerning the state that our country is in today. We cannot point our finger at the younger generation and say it's all their fault because it's not all their fault. They have been led to where they are. And how sad some of their situations are. It breaks your heart. I hope and pray that these lessons on the home and the family have been helpful to you. They've caused me to do some thinking. If you're not a Christian, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you're not much of a mother or a father in your family. You're part of the problem. The greatest thing that you can possibly do for your family is to be a sincere, dedicated, true to the heart child of God. And it'll make all the difference in the world in your family relationship. And you know why this is so important, brethren? 
because the status of the home and the family is why the church is in the state it's in too. The church is a result of what has happened to the family. And when the family is all out of whack and the fuss and the fight and the squirm and the terrible things involved and you can't even have any easy dealings, it is any wonder we have some of the problems we do in church. Behind it all is God through Christ Jesus solving the problems of me and you as we make up this world which we live. May God help us see the need to be just Christian, to be a blood-washed soul in the likeness of Jesus. It makes a difference. May God help us have that true in our life. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. If you are the problem and you've messed up your family because of your own attitude, may the Lord help you to see and stand on your own two feet and seek forgiveness and make it right. Would you come to Jesus while we stand together? If you have questions or comments concerning today's lesson, you may send those to Petersburg Church of Christ, 205 Russell Street, Petersburg, Tennessee, 37144. Or you may email us at Petersburg Church of Christ at hotmail.com. You may also request a copy of today's lesson through the same method. Be sure to include today's date along with the station on which this program aired and the title of the lesson. We hope to see you again next week right here on this station at the same time.